welcome back friends to part four of the Sturdy Oak Winter Sleigh. The Winter Sled, today we've got, well it's going to be exciting, we've got the slats all cut. We're going to get those, that mortise cut in and that all completed as well as We'll do a cool radius, kind of an old, like you remember the old uh, flexible fly, were they flexible flyers? Red riders? I don't remember. The old sleighs kind of had that kind of traditional. So let's, let's go up front. I'll take you up there and uh, show you how all of this goes together. So here we are up front and here is, remember that nose piece that we did last time that we put uh, up front there that we used the, the Stanley number 50 to cut that uh, a dado in. So this, uh, these pieces, these oak slats, will slide in there a half inch, just like that. And that will secure that front end. Now here, what we're going to do is we're going to cut a mortise in both sides of those runners for that to go inside there 3 8 just like those center dividers, little arch pieces, and that will secure it. So if we push weight on the front of here, that we c it will support the front of those slats, as well as give us a really... Uh, really a durable point that we can hook either a handle to or a rope or whatever it is we decide to do that won't be relying upon screws or glue or anything that'll actually be mortised into the runners. So very strong. So it's a, a very clever, uh, a clever and simple design here. Let me show you how they slide in from the backside. Let me move this clamp out of your way. You can see better there. Okay, so here we can see how these slats will slide right in there. Maybe this one would be better here in there and hold that all together just like that. And kind of float in there. We'll have to figure out a way to secure these guys up front. Uh, maybe, maybe we can just leave them open. We'll, we'll see, see what happens. All this is kind of uh, kind of seat of the pants here. Let, okay, let's cut those mortises out and, and then uh, get it all kind of put back together. So while I had the clamp on, I just took and just measured everything on that front that it was all equal on both sides and then drew a line around there with the pencil. So that is the exact size of our bull nose piece there. And then we can chisel that out. We'll go, uh, we'll go three eighths of an inch uh, deep with, with this one here on both sides. So I got the first of the two mortises done here. I just did this one here real quickly to show you. Then we'll do the second one over here together. Uh, but you can see these are, of course, you know, whenever you're doing this stuff, make sure you keep track of uh, when you're hand planing material and you don't have like using edges and planers and stuff, so it's not super, well, not, pr not when I do it, it's not super precise and each one's got to be kind of a custom fit. So let's see how, looks like that goes, goes in there nicely. I'm here at seat. So that is really great. So that'll go in there. That's in there three eighths or so. And then when we, well, of course, when we pull on that, See if I can give you a focus here, not focused. When we pull on that, whether it be, you know, whatever we decide for the handle, um, then we'll want, then um, it, it'll be strong. You know, it's not relying, relying upon any joints or anything like that. So I think that that will work out really good. Uh, regarding handles, you know, a, a lot of folks said, uh, recommended putting a rope on it. That's kind of the first thing that comes to mind. Um, and that's fine, but if you're pulling, uh, if you're pulling a child, uh, and you go downhill, of course, you know, then it runs into you. So I'm thinking uh, maybe a handle uh, would be better. So we'll, we'll get to that in an upcoming video here. But for now, let's, let's chop this mortise. I'll show you how, how I did that. I just used a chisel and then we'll fit it all together. We'll cut that rear radius and we'll start to kind of see, see how everything looks. All right, friends, here we go. This is the fun bit. This is the, we'll cut this mortise out. we will be using the three quarter inch. This is my, the old Stanley 750. This is my favorite, my favorite chisel. If I could just have one, this would be the one that I'd, well, that's would be the one that I'd choose here. So we've got those pencil lines there, right? So, and those pencils that, that pencil, it has a thickness. So when I first started doing these, I kept like it was really getting it was getting a little frustrated because every time I'd cut a mortise it was uh it was bigger it was too too big they were like a little bit sloppy just a light touch there um and then I finally realized that I wasn't accounting for the thickness of the pencil lead so usually I'll just come back to the inside really important these first ones a very light very light touch just like that remember how we did the chisel not like this but like this so it doesn't mash into the into the wood here. So I'm gonna do the same thing over here. This is that's one of the best things when you have some time and you're not in any hurry. Nothing's pressing. 
nice weekend day to you take your time and do a really nice job with these. Very, very satisfying. So I received several comments about uh, the people were distracted by the green tape on my injured thumb there. So I took it off there so you can enjoy, you can enjoy the carnage there and the, get those from the dirt biking. So once we, uh, once you get those, so you see we're cutting across the grain there. And the grain's running this way. Don't have too much luck uh, cutting uh, with the grain. It seems to split out and and such. And so what I'm really careful with that. What I, I will, I will put the chisel on there just to the inside. That's really easy to trim later. So this and, and this I'll hit even lighter. Just just a little bit. Just to kind of give myself a reference point. Very light touch on that one. Or slide it in like that. That's all you need. You don't need any more than that. Do the same thing over here. Also, uh, I've got got a lot of questions on, uh, as those of you guys are astute, astute observers have noticed that I've got a, a new watch. Um, Mrs. W got me a really special Christmas gift this year. She bought me a, a watch I always wanted. The, um, I'm wearing it now. This is the, the Seiko Tuna. Um, really interesting history. They're probably, they're probably the, about the toughest watches made. And you mean you can argue G-Shock? Of course, G-Shocks. Those are, you know, those are super, super tough watches. But um, and I, I think they're cool and all. But I, I don't. They're just, they're just, they're just a little bit too. They're just a little bit too much for me. They're, they're, they're I guess I. I don't want to offend anyone, but I, I've had a couple of them, and I, I always thought, I think they're they're a little bit gaudy. Um, maybe that's the wrong word. I, I guess the, 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 probably what I should I should say is just that uh, I, I kind of like the old school analog watches. They 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 just they give me the fizz where the the G shocks don't. However, uh, I you know Jack wanted a tough watch. He, I kept buying him Timexes. Um, because he's he just doesn't really care too much about clothing or anything like that. You know, he's like, yeah, whatever. I don't really care. And, and it, they would last him about a month or so, and then they would break. And so I thought, well, I'll get him. I'll get you a watch. It won't break. So I got him the classic G-Shock. I, I bought one of those when they first came out, like in 1985 or something. It was a long time ago. I still have it actually, but the crisp, or the glass broke on it, so it's not uh, not usable. It gets it got water in it. Um, so I got him one of those, and he really likes it, and that's a great choice, and they're not very expensive, you know, they're like, you can get them on like $60 or so. Um, and I would, uh, that's not a bad way to go. I would go with, I'll probably order one of those myself, because, you know, when we go dirt biking and stuff, because this one here is it's too heavy. It's, it's, a, it's a big watch, and it's really heavy. It's got that protective this whole silver cover on here is a shroud, a protective shroud, and then it covers uh, the sides there, but you can still index the bezel right here. So that's what, so it makes a pretty heavy watch in it. But I noticed it's not really great when you're riding dirt bikes because it, uh, it just beats the tar out of you flapping up and down because so it's, it's so heavy. But for everything else, it's really a, one of the most comfortable uh, watches I've ever worn. Uh, so I'll probably get one of those G-Shocks to, um, when we go riding. So it's there's just not so much mass on there. Okay, so you can see there, I have to talk in there. Uh, okay, see there, what I'm doing, the process is, is, is we'll just start with our chisel and we'll, uh, we'll take about a, about a sixteenth of an inch or so out with each pass. And it's about the depth of what we cut on the sides there. And it actually goes pretty quick, you know. So we figure uh, figure we want to go three-eighths deep, right? So that's about six passes, uh, give or take, you know, if we do it right. And then I'll move over here and then uh, go this way. My, well, my, clamp's, my clamp's totally in the way here. That's way too deep there. But... Uh, I'll move that clamp here, but 
you run into that night run into that wall you can feel it and break that off there and then you just repeat the process right you put your chisel in there and give it a good now now that you're down deep and those sides are protected you can really put some put the put the swede to it as my granddad used to say a strong a strong hit powerful stroke he uh, my granddad worked with a, a guy that was from sweden um, they were they were good friends they but they always had a really good banter back and forth and because this well swedes swedes by and large you know tra traditionally they've been big you know big guys and strong people and this guy my granddad worked with, he was no exception. He was a, my granddad called him the big Swede. So anything, anytime anything needed persuading, like a, we needed to use a, a pry bar or a sledgehammer, he'd say, oh, put the Swede on it. <laughs> you know, he always equated uh, strong with, with Swedes. So, uh, so you can put the Swede on it when you get down there little ways. I'm, I'm being a little aggressive on that side because I can't get to it with the way my clamp is there, but I, I don't want to interrupt our, our stimulating conversation. So once we get that mortise down there close, you can take now is a good time with your chisel and just uh, clean up, clean up those edges. And if you've, if you've, your, for ed, your, your ends are we're not completely vertical. You can kind of check that. You can check that with your combination square. You can hold it there and see. But I think it looks pretty good. Looks like our depth is all pretty good with the chisel. It's a little bit high right there, but if you have a, this is a wonderful tool here. One of the, uh, was one of the hardest ones. Uh, I looked for one forever, and then one of my subscribers sent me one. Uh, and then my father-in-law, Vince, he sent me one too. So I've got two of them now. Uh, but it's a it's a hand plane, but this this will uh, pr ensure that I can check and it'll cut cut anything that's sticking up proud and ensure that we have a nice or a hand router. Excuse me, we have a nice uh, consistent uh, bottom to our. Yeah, there's a couple little high spots there. It'll, it'll point them out for you. But that looks pretty good. You don't need that. You can do everything with the chisel. Just take your time. And before I do too much cleaning up and trimming, uh, I'll make sure you get all of those little shavings and flakes out of there. But before you do too much trimming, uh, you always want to try your uh, stick your tenon in there and see and make sure that it's. Because if you're if you're on the margins, you know you don't want to take anything out if it, that little bit's going to help kind of keep it tight. But, but that's nice and tight. That's really good. That's I'm real happy with that. That's the that looks good. Okay, so let's uh, let's put it back together and then determine that rear radius together and see what uh, how, what what we I think we ought to do with that. So we can put our pieces together here. I've got the rails all clamped together, starting to look like a, uh, a sleigh now. And then we can insert our slats here just to kind of see how it all looks. It really, I like the proportions of it. It turned out really good. You never know sometimes. I mean, maybe it'd probably be better to put everything, sketch everything out on paper, but I, I just don't have the patience for that. I like to, to start doing it and I, you know, you know it when you see it type of a thing right there. That looks nice, doesn't it? Love the length of it, love the width of it. These look great. We'll, we'll space these three quarters of an inch off the sides and then whatever comes out, but should be right around a quarter inch per on, on the inside there. That way the snow and stuff will fall through. 
That looks great. Oh, that looks, you know, should we put a radius in there? Let's, let me move the camera here. Get a better look on it here. So should we put a radius on there? On the back? I think so. Versus a square. It does look kind of nice on the, on the back right there. I think we should do a radius. So to do that, um, let's push all these together. We'll push them together. Make sure that they're all, they're all kind of squared and all the way up, seated. Like that. And now we need to find something that we can draw a radius with. And you know what that's going to be? Where'd it go? Yep, yeah, you know it. You called it. It's going to be the... It's going to be the ye old bar stool, right? Right? Okay. So uh, how far do we want that to stick out the back? That's going to look, that's going to look nice. Make sure these guys aren't slipping, slipping out on us. But that's the, that's the beauty of the, of the handcrafted projects, right? They don't have to be perfect. A lot of the stuff I do, I, well, you know, as you get better, you get your eye gets better too. But I will just kind of eyeball this, estimate the center of this guy here. And I think that looks pretty good. What if we did this? Just like that. What would be wrong with that, huh? That looks great. That's the way a sled ought to look, huh? Right there with the, the round. That turned out good. I think that that was the, the correct thing to do. It uh, really finishes it off nice. Let me get a different angle here. There you can see it a little bit better. The, the spacing's not, not done yet. I just kind of eyeballed them in there and placed them in there. But it looks, I think it looks really nice. It uh, is plenty of, definitely plenty of, of stiffness between them. Um, that 3 8 thickness was just about right. I think the dimensions turned out really good. It's really pretty. So the next question we have to an answer is, a, is an important one. I'm going to need your input on that. We'll do a poll and then we'll do whatever uh, you guys think would look best for it. And so the question is this, should we, should we finish it in a, a natural finish, meaning um, wood grain color, a clear finish? Um, I was thinking for doing, since it's going to be such a rough duty or, or hard, hard use, uh, we could use the water locks. They have a marine grade stuff. It's uh, rated for outdoor that I've read is really, really good. So we could do something like that and that would maintain the, the, the natural look of it. Or do we want to paint it um, like, you know, traditional red uh, or green, you know, kind of imagine kind of Christmas color. Um, we could do go that way. Too. We could do white too. I don't think that would be very good though. So let's let's go between this. We'll go between this. Uh, should we do it at the natural finish? I'll put in a poll. So vote what you think versus a red or a green. And um, and then whatever you guys decide, whatever you choose on that, well, that's what I'll do. Because um, I think it would look good either way. Any one of those three three would be would be pretty nice. So so put a comment. Don't forget, click the thumbs up if you enjoy these videos and. Um, We'll see you guys on the next one. So welcome back, everyone, to a very beautiful and cold winter morning on the homestead. January 3rd, 2018, and a chilly 17 degrees outside. And the promise of snow coming, which is something I look forward to so much. You know, the snow is always a blessing and a curse because I, I look forward to it, and I get so excited, and it's so nice to have it. But I'm always a little bit sad when it goes away. But I guess that's what makes it important. If we had it here all the time, we wouldn't appreciate it. And that leads me to a really interesting conversation that we had during our, our morning devotional. Um, our family, 
we get together as a family and we um, uh, go over our, our church has what they call a quarterly, which is a, a study guide. Basically, it's kind of a Bible study of, of, uh, of outline. Um, then they do four times a year uh, that uh, usually has a particular theme. And it's, a, it's nice for us because you can kind of uh, go follow it day by day and, and it just kind of helps you keep on track. It's just a guideline. Of course, you can expand it and, and um, take it wherever you want it. Need or need it to go. Uh, but what we do is we, we kind of use it as a guideline, and then um, the particular topic or the theme for this quarter that started at the end of December is um, materialism. Materialism. So what we try to do is is we try to, how does this lesson and, and what, what, what the, the Bible and what God is trying to teach us about this particular topic, how does that relate to our particular family in regards to materialism? And we had a, such a, a very interesting conversation, and I'm always trying to um, give analogies to Jack or create analogies um, to help him to understand these lessons. And the analogy that I gave him was this, that, uh, you know, for example, imagine that there, there's a, a family that's struggling. Maybe they're living in a one-room apartment and and uh, barely making enough money to, to buy food and to pay rent, and it's a stressful situation, and the car's got bald tires, and they just don't know how they're going to get through the year. They don't know how they're going to, uh, they don't even have enough money to, to just to, for the necessities, let alone anything outside of that. And when you are a person of faith, when you're a Christian, when you find yourself in that environment, that's the time where you're usually closest to God. And I think the reason why is because you have a need and you see that you can't get yourself out of it or not anytime soon, and you need help. And that's when you rely upon and you lean upon God the most. Therefore, that's when you're the closest, when you have that connection, because you're spending time with him. And it's no different than a friend. If you have a friend that uh, you don't spend any time with and you don't uh, call or uh, inquire or check upon or show any interest in, that friendship will, will, will die. Um, yeah, there'll be an acquaintance, but it won't be close. It takes effort on both sides uh, to maintain that. And the same thing goes for a relationship with God. And the we put God in such a difficult position um, when he we ask him to answer prayers or to get us out of particular situations because nine times out of ten or more that um, we it it, um, it 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 removes us from that from his presence. In other words, we stop relying upon him and we start relying upon those things that he's given us. So can you imagine as, a, as if you were a father and your son was asking for something uh, that you knew would draw him away from you, that you knew would uh, make you irrelevant um, and not, no longer necessary, how, how, um, how, how reluctant would you be to, to grant this if it was in your power? And yet God still does that, still does that. And then we get these, we, you know, he'll, we'll uh, receive these things or he'll get us out of a bind and, and maybe we ask for a job or something that would produce, give us more money so that we can have a nicer home and take better care of our families. And then we start relying upon those things. You know, and you see the sign, Jesus saves. And Jesus saves on the billboard, the person that doesn't have anything, that is a powerful message. But the person that has a um, million dollars in the bank account and has got a BMW and he sees that same sign, what does he think? Jesus saves, saves from what? Saves me from my, my, my nice car, saves me from my secure uh, job and my uh, millions of dollars in the banks. You know, that's, that's where your heart, that's where his heart is. And that's where his um, security is. Uh, and it's a dangerous thing. It, it's, it's, it, we, it, it makes me, it gives me sympathy for, for God that, that here we ask for these things, and and he gives them knowing that many times it's going to draw us away. The other side of it, though, is that uh, there are a lot of uh, well-meaning Christians out there who will say, well, r- r- money is the root of all evil. Well, it, it can be, and so can food, and so can a lot of things that can be used for good or evil. But there's many, many examples of, of the, the patriarchs and, and men and women that are held up as icons of faith, examples of faith that were very wealthy. Even many examples of of uh, uh, God's people and, and that he made wealthy himself. Uh, um, so it's it's not so simple. Some people can handle it, and some people cannot. 
But the, the bottom line of the lesson was this, is that uh, if you find that uh, these things, these blessings that have come upon you um, are starting to distract you from what's important and to take you away from that friendship, that relationship, um, then you need to take a hard look at it. And, and certainly we, uh, my family falls into that category as well. You know, how, where, is our, where is our center? You know, where's our core? Where, where, where is our, our, our rock and our foundation? Is it coming from? Is it coming from um, money? Is it coming from security and savings and, and these things? Or is it, do we need to um, refocus on, on what the most important thing is? Because you can chase those things, and people do. We see it all the time, and and money, and security, and finances, and all those things, and and they do provide, and they do take care of people. But at the end, when you're at the end of your life, and, and that's all that you you spent your entire life doing, um, it's you know, gravel in the mouth, uh, so to speak, instead of um, a peace of mind and and a legacy left behind of um, that you can be proud of and and without regret I guess is a thing so well I'm rambling so but anyway the point I wanted to make was it is a new year and if you've fallen away and if you've lost that relationship with God um, now it's, it's always a good time you can get started and uh, find yourself uh, um, a program or something that will help you stay on track and uh, just uh, be faithful and do it and you'll be amazed where you can be a year from now so That's it. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you guys on the next video.